All right, folks, this is 10-4, muscle tissue 10-4. So what we're going to be, this is the meat of the chapter. This is talking about 10-4 and 10-5 is the meat of the chapter. It's going to be talking about how the motor neuron tells the muscle to contract and then how the muscle contracts. So play these videos as much as you have to and replay my, uh, my MP4 lecture as much as you have to to get this material. Because I guarantee you, here's one of the test questions on, the, on, on lecture exam three. The following are a list of events involved in muscle contraction. Put them in order. Problem with that question is there's lots of events. So get this stuff. Play it many times. Nerve impulses, also known as action potentials, travel from the brain or spinal cord to trigger the contraction of skeletal muscles. An action potential propagates down a motor neuron to a skeletal muscle fiber. The site where a motor neuron excites a skeletal muscle fiber is called the neuromuscular junction. This junction is a chemical synapse consisting of the points of contact between the axon terminals of a motor neuron and the motor end plate of a skeletal muscle fiber. The events at the neuromuscular junction occur in seven coordinated steps. Step 1. An action potential travels the length of the axon of a motor neuron to an axon terminal. Step 2. Voltage-gated calcium channels open and calcium ions diffuse into the terminal. Step 3. Calcium entry causes synaptic vesicles to release acetylcholine via exocytosis. Step 4. Acetylcholine diffuses across the synaptic cleft and binds to acetylcholine receptors which contain ligand-gated cation channels. Step 5. These ligand-gated cation channels open. Step 6. Sodium ions, shown here in red, enter the muscle fiber, and potassium ions, shown here in blue, exit the muscle fiber. The greater inward flux of sodium ions relative to the outward flux of potassium ions causes the membrane potential to become less negative. Step 7. Once the membrane potential reaches a threshold value, an action potential propagates along the sarcolemma. Neural transmission to a muscle fiber ceases when acetylcholine is removed from the synaptic cleft. This removal occurs in two ways. One, acetylcholine diffuses away from the synapse. Two, acetylcholine is broken down by the enzyme acetylcholinesterase to acetic acid and choline. Choline is then transported into the axon terminal for the resynthesis of acetylcholine. All right, there's a lot of things to explain on that video right there. So first of all, let me start simply and tell you that the plasma membrane of a muscle myofiber is called a sarcolemma. Just like the, the smooth endoplasmic reticulum had a special name called the sarcoplasmic reticulum, we talked about that already, the plasma membrane has a special name and it's called the sarcolemma. So there's that. Secondly, the outside of most cells in our body are positively charged. And the in cell, inside, and that's immediately outside the cell. That's immediately outside the membrane because uh, depending on the glycocalyx, further outside the cell could actually be negatively charged, but there's a big glycocalyx, a, a glycoprotein coat uh, 
so that's a whole bunch of glucoses and some proteins and stuff. Uh, glyco, glycocalyx is glycoproteins. Carbohydrates and proteins connect them. So way out here, you know, and I say way out, I'm, I'm talking micrometers. But immediately outside the membrane, it's positively charged. And immediately inside the membrane, it's negatively charged. Well, that's a gradient. And what can happen is, if any of those positive charges flow in, and by the way, those positive charges happen to be sodium, then we depolarize the membrane. Right now, it's polar. It has poles. It has a positive side and a negative side. It has endedness, and we call that polarity. Well, we could diminish that endedness or that polarity. We could depolarize it by allowing positives to flow in. And in fact, that's how we talk to the muscle cell. Now, more to follow on that in the nerve chapters of A and P2, but for right now, we'll leave it at that. All right, so here's what's going on. Now, that video said seven coordinated steps. That's an arbitrary number. It could be 20 coordinated steps, depending how, how detailed you want to break steps into. But let's just look at what we have here. Well, first of all, we have synaptic vesicles in our neuron. This is a neuron. It's the synaptic knobs of a neuron. It's a motor neuron. It's going to tell a muscle to contract. We have synaptic vesicles in the uh, synaptic knob of our motor neuron. And they're ready to fuse and exocytosize their contents. They're ready to do it. But they have to get a signal. And that signal is calcium. All right, so let's look and see where calcium comes from. What happens is an action potential rushes down the end of the neuron. And when it does that, it opens these channels, which are called voltage-gated calcium channels. And calcium rushes in. So when this action potential comes down, remember what I just said it was. It was sodium rushing into the cell. Well, that changes the voltage because how we, me how we measure this electrical gradient across the membrane, how we measure that is millivolts. Whoops. Ooh, didn't mean to do that. Let me erase that. It's positive on the outside, negative on the inside. So we measure that in millivolts. And a depolarization wave, a signal, if you will, an action potential, is really just the propagation of the depolarization down the axon or across the muscle. So when that happens, this protein here senses the voltage change. It's a voltage-gated calcium channel. And when it senses the voltage change, it opens. And calcium rushes in. So that's what's happening here. The action potential sweeps down to the end of the axon. The voltage-gated calcium channels sense the change in voltage. They open and calcium rushes in. Now what? Well, now calcium tells those synaptic vesicles to fuse. Calcium helps these synaptic vesicles fuse and release their neurotransmitter. And that neurotransmitter at the neuromuscular junction happens to be acetylcholine. That's the neurotransmitter that we use to contract our muscles. You're going to learn a lot of other neurotransmitters in AMP2. And you're going to learn acetylcholine in more detail in AMP2. But for right now, that's the neurotransmitter you need to know. All right, now what? Now what is these neurotransmitters bind their receptors? These are called ligand gated channels or ligand gated receptors. And the ligand is like saying automobile. It's like saying automobile. It's pretty generic, you know. Automobile is everything: pickup trucks, cars. I mean, it, it, an automobile is a lot of things. Ligand is generic like that. It's like saying automobile. So if you, and, and these are ligand gated receptors or chemically gated receptors. They bind the ligand or the ligand, some people call it, and they open. So that's what's going to happen next. Here's the acetylcholine binding its receptor. Acetylcholine binds its receptor, sodium rushes in. Now the muscle is depolarizing. And that signal is going to sweep across the sarcolemma. Remember, the sarcolemma is just a plasma membrane. It's a phospholipid bilayer plasma membrane, just like you've always learned. 
but just has a fancy name when we're talking about muscle. All right, so we're depolarizing the, the cell, and that signal sweeping across the cell. Well, we want the signal to stop eventually. We don't want to contract our muscle and go into pathological tetany and, and have cramps and problems all the time. So what we want to do is we want to remove this neurotransmitter signal because that's one thing you have to do to relax a muscle. Well, these little half moons here are an enzyme called acetylcholinesterase. And it's abbreviated right here, A-C-H-E, acetylcholinesterase. And since it's not spelled out for you up there, I will. Acetylcholinesterase. The acetylcholinesterase. Enzymes usually end in ACE, acetylcholinesterase. This little yellow half moon is acetylcholinesterase, and it breaks down the acetylcholine. It breaks it down into acetic acid and choline. And what happens is the choline goes back up into the neuron. So the, it can be reused to make more acetylcholine. But the acetic acid doesn't. It diffuses away. But don't worry about that because the neuron has a lot of acetic acid. Matter of fact, all of our cells have a lot of acetic acid. It happens to be one of the compounds that we find in metabolism when we make acetyl-CoA that enters the Krebs cycle. So we have lots of acetic acid that we can draw from. We don't have a lots of, we don't have a lots of, we don't have a lot of choline, so we do reuptake of the choline. All right, so that's how we tell the muscle to contract. Now, how does it contract? Well, this is called the contraction cycle. And the contraction cycle looks like this. The contraction cycle begins, and by the way, we're going to talk about something in here, and it's called excitation-contraction coupling. And that's actually number one right here. We just talked about excitation. We just talked about the motor neuron telling the muscle to contract. Okay, so the muscle is signal received. Roger, got it. And then we are going to talk about contraction, and that's all right here. But really, number one is called excitation-contraction coupling. How do we know the excitation leads to contraction? What, what is that that's coupling the two together? Because two through six here is the actual contraction. Well, what we're going to do is look at this as one through six, contraction cycle, and then go back and look at the excitation-contraction coupling what is actually happening between the motor neuron firing and the myofilament sliding past one another. That's what we're going to, so we'll look at that afterwards. Okay, this is the contraction cycle. First of all, these yellow, there are yellow uh, areas on my actin. They are myosin head binding sites. So this myosin head right here would love to bind that yellow. But it can't because my tropomyosin molecule is in the way. See how my tropomyosin is in the way? Well, how do I get that tropomyosin out of the way? Well, one way you can get the tropomyosin out of the way is you can have calcium bind to the troponin. And the calcium troponin complex changes shape. And as it turns out, the troponin is hooked to this turquoise tropomyosin. So when the troponin changes shape, it drags the tropomyosin out of the way of the myosin head binding site. So the first thing that has to happen is calcium has to bind the troponin. That's the first thing that has to happen. Well, there we have it. Calcium bound to the troponin. Here, here's calcium. It bound to the troponin. The troponin and tropomyosin change shape. And look at all of these exposed binding sites. All of these yellow binding sites are myosin head binding sites. And now myosin heads can bind to them. And all because calcium bound to the troponin. Okay. Now the myosin heads bind to the yellow myosin head binding sites. Here's a myosin head bound to it. Now, when these myosin heads are binding to their binding sites, they're already cocked. They're like a set mouse trap. So this is already cocked right here. This is already cocked. 
it's ready to swivel this way and turn out like that. It's ready to go that way. So when the myosin heads bind the myosin head binding sites after the subsequent calcium conformational calcium induced conformational change these bind and are ready to swivel the reason why they're cocked is because they've already hydrolyzed ATP see when you hydrolyze ATP you become ADP plus an inorganic phosphate well look what this is right here that myosin head has already hydrolyzed ATP and that energy caused it to cock it's like a set mouse trap so this myosin head binding, the myosin head binding sites on the actin is called a cross bridge formation. So now we have a cross bridge formation. Then they swivel. They're like a set mouse trap that when they bind, they swivel. So they're swiveling right now. And this says pivoting, pivoting or swiveling. So that's what's happening. It's pivoting or swiveling. Now when that happens, the ADP and the inorganic phosphate fall off. That's important because there's only one way that this cross, bread, cross bridge releases, and that is a new ATP has to bind. So I just swiveled. Now a new ATP comes in, and when the new ATP binds, my myosin head falls off my myosin head binding site. My cross bridge detaches. Now think of this. Think of... Um, uh, it's slipping my mind, the word. Well, it'll come back to me. I'll think and th tell you something in a second. So, this is ATP binding the myosin head binding site and allowing it to release from the actin. Now, that ATP can be hydrolyzed and I can recock my myosin head. Here, my ATP is hydrolyzed. See, it was ATP back here. But now it's ATP, ADP and phosphate right there. Where did the energy go? It went into cocking the head. The head is recocked. And now it's ready to bind another myosin head binding site and swivel again. So if it keeps binding and swiveling and releasing and binding and swiveling and releasing and binding and swiveling and releasing, if it keeps doing that, it'll walk, it'll walk these thin filaments right towards the center of the sarcomere. It'll reduce the, the uh, H zone. And your sarcomere gets shorter. So it'll just keep on doing this. And this is the big picture showing you this. What happens is, how come these myosin heads here aren't binding the myosin head binding site? Answer is tropomyosin's in the way. How do I get tropomyosin out of the way? Calcium binds to the troponin, causes a shape change, a conformational change, which drags tropomyosin out of the way. Well, that's good because now the myosin head binding sites, now the myosin heads can bind their binding sites and swivel. Absolutely, they can. And that swiveling is the contraction. So I have a question for you. Where did the calcium come from? Well, here's the answer. Because it all started with this calcium. And here's the answer. The calcium was stored in the SR. This is sarcoplasmic reticulum. Remember, it's just a fancy name for smooth ER. But why did the calcium leave the SR? And the answer is the depolarization wave from the motor neuron swept down the T-tubule into my triad. Remember, this whole area right here is called a triad. That was in the first mini lecture. So that, ex that depolarization swept down the T-tubule right into here, into my triad. And it caused these calcium channels to open. And calcium rushed out of the SR and into the cytoplasm. They diffuse down to the troponin and bound to them, which drag the tropomyosin out of the way, and the myosin heads were able to bind and swivel. So that's what happened there. Now we need to do two things to relax. Well, we need to do three things to relax this muscle. First thing we have to do is we have to chew up all that acetylcholine with acetylcholinesterase. Second thing we have to do is make sure we pump all this calcium back into the SR. And that's going to require energy. And the third thing we have to do is ATP has to bind to that myosin head or it'll never release from the myosin head binding site. And I, I just remember the word. This is why, that number three right there, 
is why rigor mortis happens when you're dead. You die, and because you're dead, you're no longer making ATP. How could you possibly be making ATP when you're dead? You're not eating an apple anymore. You're dead. So you're not making ATP anymore. Your muscles probably have one last contraction in them. Maybe two, but not many. You don't have much ATP. So what rigor mortis is, is you die and the muscles contract. But remember, to release this myosin head from the myosin head binding site on the actin, you need ATP. But you're dead. You don't have any ATP. So the myosin heads stay attached to the myosin head and binding sites and your muscles stay contracted. This is rigor mortis. Now rigor mortis lasts a few hours, but why does it why do you eventually start relaxing your muscles? Well, you're dead. Your muscles are starting to break down. So it's not really so in, it's not really so it's not really the the fact that you're relaxing your contraction more than that your proteins are breaking down because you're dead. So that's rigor mortis and then uh, the breakdown of proteins afterwards. Typically, a single motor neuron arising in the brain or spinal cord conducts action potentials that travel to hundreds of skeletal muscle fibers within a muscle. The sequence of events that converts action potentials in a muscle fiber to a contraction is known as excitation-contraction coupling. If we look at a single muscle fiber, we see that an action potential travels across the entire sarcolemma and is rapidly conducted into the interior of the muscle fiber by structures called transverse tubules. Transverse, or T-tubules, are regularly spaced in foldings of the sarcolemma that branch extensively throughout the muscle fiber. At numerous junctions, the T-tubules make contact with the calcium-storing membranous network known as a sarcoplasmic reticulum, or SR. Where it abuts the T-tubule, the SR forms sac-like bulges called terminal cisterni. One portion of a T-tubule plus two adjacent terminal cisterni is known as a triad. The membranes of the T-tubule and terminal cisterni are linked by a series of proteins that control calcium release. As an action potential travels down the T-tubule, it causes a voltage-sensitive protein to change shape. This shape change opens a calcium release channel in the SR, allowing calcium ions to flood the sarcoplasm. This rapid influx of calcium triggers a contraction of the skeletal muscle fiber. Thus, calcium ions are responsible for the coupling of excitation to the contraction of skeletal muscle fibers. Okay, she said it. The excitation contraction coupling is actually calcium. And you probably put that together already when we kept talking about how does the myosin head bind the myosin head binding site on the actin. And we kept saying that, well, calcium's got to bind the troponin to make tropomyosin flip out of the way. So you probably put it together all right. Excitation contraction coupling is due to calcium. How did you get calcium released? Excitation. Why did you contract? Calcium, excitation, contraction, coupling. And this is the crossbridge cycle. So this is the cycle of the myosin head binding the act, myosin head binding site on the actin, swiveling, releasing, binding, swiveling, releasing, binding, swiveling, releasing. Of course, ATP is involved. It requires energy to cock the myosin head, and it, and it requires ATP to release the myosin head from the actin. The contraction of a skeletal muscle generates the force necessary to move the skeleton. A contraction is triggered by a series of molecular events known as the crossbridge cycle. In a skeletal muscle fiber, the functional unit of contraction is called the sarcomere. <laughs> 
A sarcomere shortens when myosin heads in thick myofilaments form cross bridges with actin molecules in thin myofilaments. The formation of a cross bridge is initiated when calcium ions released from the sarcoplasmic reticulum bind to troponin. This binding causes troponin to change shape. Tropomyosin moves away from the myosin binding sites on actin, allowing the myosin head to bind actin and form a cross bridge. Also note that the myosin head must be activated before a cross bridge cycle can begin. This occurs when ATP binds to the myosin head and is hydrolyzed to ADP and inorganic phosphate. The energy liberated from the hydrolysis of ATP activates the myosin head, forcing it into the cocked position. A cross bridge cycle may be divided into four steps. Step 1. Cross bridge formation. The activated myosin head binds to actin, forming a cross bridge. Inorganic phosphate is released and the bond between myosin and actin becomes stronger. Step 2. The power stroke. ADP is released and the activated myosin head pivots, sliding the thin myofilament toward the center of the sarcomere. Step 3. Cross bridge detachment. When another ATP binds to the myosin head, the link between the myosin head and actin weakens and the myosin head detaches. Step 4. Reactivation of the myosin head. ATP is hydrolyzed to ADP and inorganic phosphate. The energy released during hydrolysis reactivates the myosin head, returning it to the cocked position. As long as the binding sites on actin remain exposed, the crossbridge cycle will repeat. And as the cycle repeats, the thin myofilaments are pulled toward each other and the sarcomere shortens. This shortening causes the whole muscle to contract. Cross bridge cycling ends when calcium ions are actively transported back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Troponin returns to its original shape allowing tropomyosin to glide over and cover the myosin binding site on actin. Alright, so this, these images, these next images, are just that movie as still images. That's all it is. But I'll talk through them, because it doesn't hurt to hear it a couple times. The action potential in the motor neuron causes the release of a, uh, acetylcholine, and acetylcholine binds its receptors right here. And that causes depolarization of the myofiber sarcolemma, plasma membrane, and that depolarization sweeps down the T-tubules into my triad. That opens some calcium channels. There's voltage-gated calcium channels that open, and calcium rushes into the cytoplasm. Now, she called the cytoplasm sarcoplasm. When I say she, I mean the, the video lady, the lady narrating the video. Yeah, it's, it's sarcoplasm. It's just the fancy word for cytoplasm, just like sarcoplasmic reticulum is the fancy word for smooth ER, just like sarcolemma is the fancy word for plasma membrane. So, calcium rushes out of the sarcoplasmic reticulum into the sarcoplasm. Calcium binds the troponin and makes the tropomyosin slide away from the myosin head binding site. The myosin head binds the myosin head binding site and swivels. So, that's how we initiate this muscle contraction. Now, to stop it, we have to do a few things. First of all, we've got to pump calcium back into the SR, like the lady in the video said. However, there's really no sense of pumping calcium back into the SR if there's still acetylcholine in the synaptic cleft because it'll just tell it to be released again. 
So we have to almost simultaneously do all three things. Get rid of acetylcholine, pump calcium back into the SR, and down here, to order to get this myosin head to release the myosin head binding site, you need, I'm going to call this calcium pump, it's going against its concentration gradient, requires energy, you need ATP to release the myosin head from the myosin head binding site. So these three things all have to happen quite simultaneously. And there's this collage for you of starting the muscle contraction and ending the muscle contraction. All right, here's a summary of what's going on. The sarcomeres shorten, but the myofilaments do not. They slide past one another. Hence, this is called the sliding filament theory of muscle contraction. Sliding filament theory. The sarcomeres shorten, but the myofilaments do not. Calcium is what triggers it. Calcium is the excitation contraction coupler. Calcium binds troponin and makes the tropomyin shift out of the way. That exposes a myosin head binding site on the actin, which the myosin head then binds to and swivels. And that's the power stroke or the contraction. And then relaxation is due to acetylcholinesterase, calcium pumps, and ATP. See you in the next part.